Good morning to everybody once again. Today we've gone to chapter 13 of ST44. ST44.13. Pattaka Panya Sutta. Now this sutta is simply called Panya Sutta, but I've added in the prefix Attaka, meaning in the book of eight. There are eight things yeah, in the Attaka Nipata of the Anguttara. So the translation of the title, the eight discourse on wisdom. Panya means wisdom. The, you can either remember the title, Attaka Panya Sutta, now you got to remember Ataka also because if you say Panya, there could be other Panya Suttas. No? Or you can remember the reference, it's much easier. A8.2. Then if someone asks you what is the Sutta about, and you have the theme there, it's about the eight ways conducive to the arising of wisdom. It's about Buddhist training, in other words. Now, Buddhist training, as you know, it comprises three parts. Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Sila means you restrain your body and speech. Because our body and speech demands a lot of our attention. So we have to discipline it, kind of uh, direct it properly, so that it they do not distract us when we sit peacefully, when we want to deal directly with the mind, which is the second training. The second training deals with training of the mind, to train the mind to be calm, first of all, and then to be clear. They kind of go together. Calm and clear, these are two magic words, yeah? And then, underlying this calm and clarity is joy. We often forget joy. Joy is a very important aspect of meditation. That's why we smile when we meditate. And then the third training is training in wisdom. Wisdom means knowing how to apply what we know. And when we apply this knowledge and understanding, we are free from suffering. So these are the three basic training and they, they kind of go gradually. They ripen like a fruit. In fact, in, in the Buddhist training we use the imagery of fruiting, right? The result of good training is a, a fruit, pala. It's like a, another imagery is cooking. When you cook something, it takes time to cook, right? So good karma is said to we, uh, become vipaka. We, Paka means cooked. Uh, we in the front, it means in every part, huh? fully cooked, so to speak. So, we paka is the result, we often translate as result. Hala is fruit, they have the same meaning. Okay? So, we have three trainings here, yeah? they are in eight stages, and you notice they're kind of uh, they're, they're gradual, generally. Uh, However, in, in, in this age, you, you can more or less start with anyone. Uh, after, once you are well versed with the training, they kind of interact. Okay? But the eight uh, kind of gives you a good idea what you need to do when you want to live the Buddhist life. Now, let's look at the sutta, then I will explain to you. the quite a lot of introductory notes here. You can read them in your free time. I'm going to give you a kind of a digest, an overview of this sutta as fitting to this occasion and your personality. Page 152, translation is on page 152, the eighth discourse on wisdom, A8.2. Big shoes, okay, the Buddha addresses the monks. Big shoes, and it's a. Uh, I've used the Pali, the Sanskrit word, rather. Anglicize it. So, in other words, it's become English. Big shoes. It means monks. Okay. So, because the word monk has got a different kind of sense. I mean, some people use monks. It's okay to use monks. Uh, here, big shoes, we want 
to know that the Buddha is addressing the early monks. And the word bhikshu also is like a code. It means the Buddha is addressing us today. So it is like a time code, a time stamp, if you like. If not for these bhikshus in front, you won't get the sutta today. I mean, today, you know, we, we, we have this wonderful set of teachings. So we've got to make use of this, right? Of course, some scholars, they, they like to criticize all this. They say, oh, you know, early Buddhism is not really that early. It doesn't matter because when you actually practice the suttas, you get at peace. <coughs> so, early or late, the method is there. But, historically speaking, you, you cannot find something earlier than the Pali suttas, the, the earliest part. Records, memories we have of the Buddha's teaching are found in the Pali suttas. So it's, it's whether you want to argue about all this nitty-gritty of uh, recording teachings or you want to practice, despite the big difference here, right? So if you want to practice, you find there is the, the teachings are all given there. So that's the reflection on the word big shoes. So here the monk is talking to, uh, the Buddha is talking, addressing the monks because the monks are always there, ready to listen. There are these eight reasons and conditions that conduce to the gaining of wisdom, yet unattained. Wisdom that is, the fun, that is fundamental to the holy life. So you find in just one line the Buddha is defined the nature of wisdom in Buddhist terms, in early Buddhist terms. Our purpose is to gain wisdom that is not yet attained. Once again, let us be clear about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. When you go shopping for books, when you read a book, there's lots of knowledge there. You go on the internet, a lot of facts. And now, people are becoming aware that a lot of fake facts. And this is becoming a serious problem, you know, because of the uh, openness, availability, accessibility of the internet. Anyone can just take a Buddha picture, put some words there, and then sign the bottom, the Buddha. <laughs> the Buddha is not going to sue you. <laughs> but the problem is, many of those things are fake. Because if you really want to quote a Buddha, you don't say Buddha, <laughs> you, know? you mention Visutta, what reference? Okay, you can either mention volume and page or chapter and paragraph and things like that. So if you, whenever you see something and then Buddha, you can be sure that it is not accurate. You know? Maybe it's not fake, but it's not accurate. But the problem with inaccuracy is as good as being fake. So this is the problem of the openness, the, the open knowledge market, you know. Anything goes, so you be very careful. It's harder to learn today, it's a flood of knowing. So that's knowledge, okay, facts. Knowing how. I suppose you can say wisdom can be something like knowing why. Why this thing happened, causes effect. And also, also knowing how to apply this knowledge, how not to apply this knowledge. So it's an understanding. Understanding entails personal experience. So wisdom has got this personal experience. It is wisdom when you say something like, oh now I know, now I see. In, in the sutta, it's often mentioned these two things, to know and to see. We see something. Very often in English, you say, yes, I see, right? When you understand, you say, I see. And then there is this knowledge, kind of a mental image of it, and then there is, it relates to what real. So wisdom relates to something real and useful and good. So these are some qualities you must remember, the nature of wisdom. 
And most important of all, wisdom is liberating. It liberates us, it frees us from suffering. Some knowledge burdens us, right? For example, you know, on a, on, if you have a Facebook account, you find some of my friends are terrified of Facebook. They just give it up. And I told them, look, I have a Dharma Facebook. And I said, no, 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 no Facebook for me. I said, no, this one is different. You just can't. You just spend, just spend a few minutes with it and then see how. So I, I have to make good my promises, eh? So I, I treat my Facebook page like my house. And what are you trying to be funny? I said, you know, this is a private page. So you please be nice when you talk. You come to someone's house and you've got to talk civilly. <laughs> A smile, and you, you don't attack people, you don't say bad stuff, bad things, you know, bad words, things like that. You know? uh, it usually works. Of course, finally it doesn't work, you just have to throw the person out, unfortunately. Yeah, and uh, Facebook allows that. You know? So, we have that kind of, we must have that kind of understanding, this sacred space is dedicated to early Buddhism, for example. So, this person came in and Johnny and say, oh yeah, okay, so this is really amazing. I've never seen a Facebook like this, where people are so friendly and disciplined. And it's a wonderful place to learn, if you have that kind of space. But still, you know, there are some people you can't throw them out, because uh, they're not disruptive, but they're argumentative, it's quite different, you know. They, they, they like to nitpick, you know, they find faults. Whatever you write, they find faults. So you begin to know, okay, there's something unhappy about this person. Instead of learning, rejoicing, you know, or saying, wow, this is what I've been looking for, they rather say, oh, you know, why do you say this because of this wrong like this? You know? Every time there's a posting, this person is like that. So you have this. So you begin to see a personality, something wrong there, so to speak. So, but, but the point is, he's, he's in the right place, you know. Uh, he is learning something in a way, provided we are truthful and brave enough to tell this person that he's not right. Uh, this, is a, this is one benefit of the aging process. The older you are, the more right you have to tell people they are wrong and, and uh, you don't fear them retaliating because they are going to die so please don't say bad things to me. And they think twice about it. But that's not the point. But the point is, we want to learn things, not just argue. Of course, if you discuss, the question is different, you know. Finding fault is something else, right? So you find all this in, in Buddhist training. So let us look at these eight points, how all these things fit in nicely. So that's wisdom. And the Buddha goes on to say, fundamental to the holy life. You, you, this is the basis of Buddhist training. Holy life refers to training of a monk. Holy here means the celibacy. In other words, they have no sex. Monks have kind of a vow. A vow they say, okay, they want to let go of the world, let go of sex, let go of money. Okay, technically speaking, early Buddhism teaches that. Right? The reason is not that money or sex is bad, that there's a place for all this, but here, the monk has consciously decided, okay, I have nothing to do with the world. So they, they are leaving the world to fully dedicate themselves to take the express way to awakening in this life. That's, that's the meaning here, okay? Uh, why sex is in the way, the, the Buddha was quite humorous on this. The monks are quite humorous about sexuality. Uh, they, they say in the Samidhi Sutta, for example, it is said, sex takes time. It takes a lot of your time. <laughs> so you have no time for anything else, you know? Uh, so here, in other words, what we're saying is time is precious. So you use that time wisely, the monks and nuns at least, to calm the body, calm the mind, and gain liberating wisdom. And then they can teach and benefit us. This is, I call this uh, alternative A, okay, for the renouncing as the monk and nun. Then you have alternative B, for the lay people like you and I, we, we still live the normal worldly life, within the limits of the five precepts. We can still enjoy sensual pleasures or not, up to you. But in fact, we really enjoy sensual pleasures if we know restraint, if we understand the nature of wisdom and the five precepts. Because to enjoy means to be here in this moment. When you're eating something really good, you're eating and say, wow, this is nice. You eat when you're hungry, 
this is nice, this is wonderful. Then you, you are full, you stop eating. You have really enjoyed this food. But if you go on eating the, this your favorite food, in the end you say, wow, I can't take anymore. It's already it's disgusting now, you know. Then you don't enjoy it, right? So the wisdom of understanding what is joy and enjoyment is very important here. It means being there in the moment. Once you try to drag that momentariness, you think that this joy can be permanent and you suffer. Because that's not the true reality. So that is suffering. Right? So as lay people, we are told, okay, you must know when to stop. The five people are telling us, know when to stop. Okay? Stop killing, stop stealing, stop sexual misconduct, stop lying, stop getting drunk. So, so you have the lay approach and the monastic approach. So the holy life here refers to the monastic approach. Then the Buddha continues. And when that wisdom is gained to making it more, making it abundant and develop to fulfill fulfillment. What are the eight? So there you are, just the syllabus. Now the Buddha starts with the first one. Section two. Here because a monk dwells in dependence on the teacher. Here capital T refers to the Buddha while he is still alive. Otherwise it's anyone who is your teacher or one or other fellow brahmachari in the role of a teacher. Your brahmachari means someone who is a monk or a nun. Someone who lives a celibate life. Toward whom he has a keen sense of moral shame and moral fear, love and respect. Now you don't often you don't often get this set of words. Moral shame, moral fear, yes. Moral shame means a sense of uh, propriety. Right? You, you you won't do something. You say, oh, uh, this is not proper to do. You know what will people say? Uh, if you kind of restrain in that way. The moral fear, you say, wow, this is not good, bad karma, I'm not going to do this. So there is this space. In Asian society, this teaching of moral fear, moral shame, moral fear has been there for centuries. We don't know the exact term, but it's there. In other words, we always know there must be this social space between the, say, the man, nun, and, and the lay person. But when Buddhism went to the West in recent times, they do not have this social space. Because as you know, and mostly in the West, they have this very open idea of sexuality, of morality and so on. And that initially caused a lot of problems, especially in the, in the 90s, in the US. The Zen masters and the Vajrayana, Tukus, they really messed themselves up big time. You know, and hurt a lot of people, a lot of uh, misappropriation of funds and abuse of people and so on, so much so that it really wised up, fortunately, wised up the Americans, the Western, in the UK also they have their own problems. So they became wise up, they wise up, they stop, stop. They say, oh now we, we need to have rules, we got to have space, social space between the, the cloth or the monks and, and, the, and the nuns and the lay people. So this is moral shame, moral fear. And yet you have another beautiful pair of words, love and respect. You can't translate this any other way. Pema. Pema is the noun of pia. Pema is love. It's a kind of ordinary love. Love from between mother and child, for example. Even love between husband and wife, a normal kind of love. Here, love between teacher and pupil. In other words, you actually care for this person. And respect. Respect means accepting the person as he is. Not showing, it is not a status thing. It's not like you, you only put your palms together to a big important guy because he is a VIP. That's not Buddhism. That's not respect at all. Right? That's a power play. You notice uh, in Buddhist circles, when you put your palms together, the other person also put his palm back to you. Because when we put our palms together, we are acknowledging that in you there is this wonderful ability to become good. 
and you return the compliment and you say, I see that in you too. So when you put your palms together, that's the meaning. Without so many words, we acknowledge the wonderful potential of us to be good, to awaken as a stream winner, or even become Buddha if you like. Right? So that's the meaning of the Anjali. Right? And when we bow to the monks, we are reminding the monks, please keep to the rules, keep to the Vinaya. And uh, if you can do that, you'll be a great teacher one day. So that is the meaning of Anjali. Even nowadays you find uh, some of this, think even Theravada monks, they're beginning to reply others. So you put your palm together, they also do that to you. Some time ago, they, traditionally, they don't normally turn a reply. They don't put their palms together. So, there is this love and respect. This picture is the first reason and condition that conduce to the gaining of wisdom, yet unattained wisdom that is fundamental to the holy life. And when the wisdom is basically made in a cultivated in a big way, it will benefit you. Right? So this first one is dependence. Now, it doesn't sound very big this way, but if you look at sometimes you can translate it as tutelage. The Pali word is Nisaya. This is one of the very first thing that you must learn if you become a monk. Tutelage. You've got to spend at least five years with a suitable teacher. Monks who miss monks or nuns who miss these first five years with a suitable teacher will never be monks. Because to become a monk is not just putting on a robe, although some people do that nowadays, you know, it's very easy to just I can go back, shave my head, wear a robe and come and say, here I am, and people think I'm a monk, you know? But not true, that's, that's not a real monk. So that five years, the called Nisaya, dependence, tutelage, is what really makes you into a monk. You live with the monks, you learn to be humble, you learn to work together, you learn fellowship, you learn to be happy, you learn Dharma and Vinaya. Those five years are very important. In my 50 years of being a Buddhist, I've met all kinds of people. And, and some of these elders who, who know, who can sense all this trouble, they always, they will email me, they will say, oh, here's this monk, you know, he's, he's only two years in the order, and now he wants to start a center. What do I do? I say, we all know what to do. You should tell this monk, don't do it, you know, we won't support you. You can say that, you know, because if you don't, you are contributing to bad karma of the monk also. We think that by not doing, we are safe. Oh no, by not doing, you can create karma too. It's just like, you know, in France, if you omit something, you also, you know, can be criminally charged. If someone is dying on the road, you could have saved his life and you didn't, you're in trouble legally in France. So if, if someone you see, let's say this old man who can't see very well, and you're walking on the road as a whole there, and you don't like this old man, you know he's going to fall into the road, and you say, I'm not doing anything, he's, he's going to fall into the hole, and you just keep quiet, and you see him fall, and you say, well, too bad, you know, you're bad karma. You're also part of it, because you could have just shouted to him or, or helped him, you see, right? So remember, omission also is karma. Right? So if, if we, we tell this man, okay, and worse than that, you actually get a center for this man, and he messes with up and you're in trouble. Right? So we had one case like this, and we, we told this man off. And then reluctantly, he you know, went somewhere to have this Nisaya. But still, he was not very disciplined. And then after a few years, he disrobed. He gave up the training. There you go. So, Without these five years, you don't learn humility. Because once you become a monk, you think, oh, I, also, I want to have a retreat center. I want to have a retirement home, just like other comfortable monks with comfortable retreat centers. That's not the way it works. You become a monk to renounce the world. Okay? So there you are, this tutelage comes number one. What about for lay people? What does this mean? If you want to be a Buddhist, you must spend some time studying the Dharma especially the suttas. Because if you don't know the suttas, then what are you? I mean, all the other religions you find, they know their scriptures, whatever it is, you know. So as Buddhists, you should at least know one or two suttas, you know. The, the idea is authentic training. Otherwise, people will tell you do this, do that, and then you get confused. 
And later you convert and say, oh, Buddhism is not good, you know. Now very often people who convert, if they say they are Buddhists, I always ask them, okay, what have you learned? <laughs> and uh, I say, you, you can take any religion you want, but please don't give Buddhism a bad name. You didn't study Buddhism at all, so don't, don't blame Buddhism. All right? If you really know the Sutta and the Dhamma well, you'll be very happy. So spend some time, find out this, the Suttas. Suttas are the best collection, even though it's not the oldest, the best collection of the Buddha's teaching. It's like you had this beautiful painting you know, in this art gallery. Someone comes along and sits there. I've seen these people, for me, they can sit for hours, they just look and gaze at the painting and absorbing the painting. And others will come and stop and oh, this is wrong, this is bad, this is not good, this all criticizing all the time. You know? So you can decide which kind of person you want to be. Right? So if you study the suttas, you get the wisdom, you get the guidance. So this is your tutelage as a lay person. Like right now we're studying the suttas, right now you're listening to me. You're still listening to the suttas. So you then you go on to study on your own, right? right so this is the first part. Now, in, in the rest, I'm going to just read the keyword because the template is there. It's all the same thing. The Buddha says, okay, you should do this and cultivate this. And this is the basis of the holy life, all right? So number two is, look at 3.2. He approaches him. Him here is the teacher that I mentioned earlier. From time to time, to ask and question him thus, how is this Bhante? What is its meaning or purpose? Okay. Now let's look at this last word, meaning, and then there is a square bracket purpose. I'm sure some of you wonder why why is there the square brackets? You know, the method I'm using, the convention I'm using in my book is for any intelligent person, even without asking me, if you look at it, you can, can guess. You know? If you look at this, when you read, you say meaning, purpose, in your mind, you have two words, juxtaposed. In other words, they are connected. In fact, they're not exactly synonyms, but they are, I call it an alternate translation. Sometimes they're synonyms, because one word is a difficult word you've never heard of before, but it's a beautiful word, I like it, but I know many people don't understand it, so I use that big word and then I'll put the simple word in the, in the square brackets. So here, there is a square brackets because the original Pali word is atta, A-T-T-H-A, without the dot under the T. Eh? Now, atta can mean goal, can mean purpose, it can also mean good. Okay? It also can mean wish. So, can you, you see the problem with the, in a sense, problem with the commerce of Pali? This is called Pali Semi. Now, Pali words are polysemous, often polysemous. In other words, one meaning like atta can have many meanings. One word like dhamma can have many meanings. Now, there is an advantage in this polys uh, polysemy in Pali. Now, in English, because it is a so-called living language, English words tend to be more narrow. For example, if I say purpose, if I say meaning, they are two different words. So imagine I translate the word atta, I only give the one word meaning, then I leave out a few other meanings, you know. So that creates a problem. That's why one way out is to use these square brackets, right? So the advantage of a polysemous word is that when you put it together, you can connect in different ways. And uh, you find the dharma is such that the dharma is versatile. Right? So if you are a teacher, you find this is a very helpful way of talking about something which is so abstract. Right? So for another thing is, look at the word, you may say, how come I use the word ask and question? Do they mean the same thing? Ask and question. So this is where I highlighted for you also in bold, and then there is a tiny number on the right. You notice number 50, right? 30 or 50. Okay, 50. Then you can see a knot at the bottom, right? The Pali word is uh, Pari Puchati. Is it mentioned here? Pari Puchati, Pari. 
panati. Right? Now, puchati means to ask. Panhati is not actually a verb, but it, it can mean to ask also. Panha means question, problem. Right? So, in Pali, both words mean the same, question. But if you look at the structure of the word, let me write this too, it's very interesting. First, we have Pali, which is very similar to Latin Pali, Greek para. Okay. Okay, put your team to us. Panhati also means to us. Of course, if you want to be humorous, you can translate panhati literally as to make it a problem. Panha. Eh? And panha in Thai also means problem. <laughs> so, pari means all around. All around. Complete, like in English, pari you got parimita. Para you have parabola, parachute. Right? All has to do with roundness, completeness. So very, very, it's the same prefix, you know, because it belongs to the same family of languages, called Indo-Aryan family of languages. English, Sanskrit, Pali, same. Yeah? So, Pari Puchati, Pari Panati means to question thoroughly. To question thoroughly. So you can translate as thoroughly. So you can imagine, you learn to enrich your language. You learn to talk more richly, more accurately. Right? So to question thoroughly. So this is what teachers do for you. They, they interpret all these teachings and you know, enrich your, your mind and your heart. Right, so you've got to ask this teacher questions. That's the whole idea. All right? now, nowadays it's very difficult to find a good teacher um, to ask questions. If I have a problem with translation, I've only got one or two months in the whole world. Can you imagine that? One or two months to approach it. And those are very good months. It's enough for them. Enough already. Eh? Then the next one, number three, comes your own practice. Section four. Having heard that Dharma, in other words, you got this answer from the teacher, he turns to two kinds of aloneness bodily aloneness and mental aloneness. This is the third condition and reason. Okay, aloneness. I purposely used the word aloneness rather than a more common solitude. Because the Pali word is upakasa. Upakasa. Instead of the usual viveka. Eh? But the, the, the effect is the same. Aloneness. Now, aloneness and loneliness are very different in English, right? Lonely is a negative feeling. Alone is a joyful feeling. For example, you say, I want to be alone. You don't say, I want to be lonely. <laughs> right? I want to be alone. In other words, you just want to be by yourself. You feel very happy, peaceful. Why do you want to be alone? What is the beauty and the benefit of aloneness? Let's look at the word beauty and benefit first. What's the difference? Why do I use this word beauty and benefit? Beauty is this feeling you have, you know, you just feel good about it. It makes you happy, beauty. Whereas benefit is something that comes to you, something that happens to you, if you like, right? So you find words begin to have different meanings, deeper meanings, when you talk drama. So here, this aloneness, the opposite of aloneness is crowdedness, right? It's, it, it's, when you're with the crowd, what's wrong being with the crowd? Well, imagine you're in a crowd. Yeah? Number one, you've got to make sure you see where you're going, eyesight. You've got to deal with vision. You've got to hear what's going on. You go into a crowd, you want to hear what's going on. Right? And then, oh, you can smell things. Yeah? Crowd smell. Okay? And then taste, you get hungry after a while. And of course, touch, people bang to you and so on and so forth. People rub against you, right? And the mind also involved, right? 
So you got to process six senses, you know, you got to deal with the six senses all at the same time. And that's quite a lot of things to process. And if you do that regularly, you say, oh, this is tiring, it becomes stressful. In the office also, you got to deal with the six senses, five senses, and you get stressful. So you always look forward to the weekend, to the holiday, to a break. So why do you do that? Because you can be alone by yourself. If you're alone by yourself, what do you normally do when you're alone by yourself when you have your break? You, you will do something very different from your work. Unless your work is your love, you know. <laughs> All right? So, uh, what I say that is, because like when I go back now, and now I'm teaching Sutta, when I go back, I'll be doing translation work, you see. So, it, that's where work and play are no different, but that's different, it's a spiritual life, okay? So, when you're alone, during your so-called holiday, by the way, the word holiday originally came from the word holy day. It started with a, a, a break. That one day in a week, you go to the holy place for worship. So, we take a break, we do something we enjoy, something we like, or maybe doing nothing. Some people say, I do nothing, I just lie down and watch the sunset. You know? That also is good. Right? So, the aloneness here is a kind of letting go of the five senses, we only deal with one, the sixth sense, the mind. We develop the mind because in a crowd, the mind is pulled in five or six ways by the senses. The mind is never its own. So when we go into meditation, into aloneness, into solitude, we develop the mind. That's why we, got in, we have to go into this aloneness. And notice, okay, we're on page 153 now, 153, section 4. <coughs> Oh, sorry, 152. 152, section 4. Having heard the Dhamma, he turns to two kinds of aloneness, bodily aloneness and mental aloneness. Bodily aloneness, you go to a quiet place. This can be a quiet place in your house. It can be a quiet time. Sometimes certain places may be quiet at certain times. You, you go there. Then... Uh, Quiet, uh, then mental aloneness is your mind. Let's go of thoughts and other things. We just free the mind from thoughts. That's what we do in meditation. So this is another way of looking at aloneness is renunciation. You know, same same process. That's another word we can use for the whole of Buddhist training, Buddhist practice. Let's look at the Buddhist training in terms of renunciation. Another word is letting go. Okay? Moral virtue, you let go of five things. Huh? The five precepts, you let go of violence, you let go of selfishness, you let go of discontent, you let go of uh, greed, you let go of mental confusion. Right? So you let go of distraction to the body and speech. And then you find more peace. And then meditation is letting go of thoughts, letting go of distractions. So you don't have to be a monk to practice renunciation. The monks have to practice it themselves. So Buddha Gosha says in the Satipatthana Sutta commentary, he says when the Buddha says monks in the Sutta, it means anyone who practices Satipatthana, anyone who practices meditation. Because when you practice meditation, in effect you are learning to let go of distractions. At that moment we are meditating, you are a monk. So there you are. Bodily aloneness, mental aloneness. Peacefulness with the body, peacefulness of the mind. Clear enough? Any questions at this, up to this point? Clear enough, yeah? Okay, so having done that, then the next step, what do we do next? Section brackets 4, or rather we go to section 5 now. It's the Buddha simply says, he is morally virtuous, and that is defined he dwells restrained by the restraint of the Pati Mukha, monastic code. Okay, these are a set of monks' rules. Today, the monks have two to seven rules, so the monks are supposed to live by the rules. Of course, some of the rules are a bit outdated, but still, the spirit of the law is there. And then, accomplished in proper conduct and proper resort. So, this monk has to behave in a proper way, face his actions, and so on. 
and the places you go to also should be wholesome, proper. You should not be wondering, say, going to resort world or some shopping center, strong places that is not proper resort. And then seeing danger in the slightest falls, the really good man will be very careful. He will not even think of doing something. He says there's a danger that I'll break the rules. For example, you know, this, uh, there's a story, quite well-known story. Monks, Theravada monks do not take food in the evening, but they can take milk products, right? Cheese, chocolates. So concerned lay people give lots of cheese and chocolate to the monks. Some of them are so, have, are so uh, what they call generous, but not very wise. They give chocolates which have got vodka and, and all this what they call drinks inside. See? They thought it's okay. Right. Technically, it's okay. Actually, if you take it as food, or you're sick, or it's mixed with other food, it's all right. But those are in tiny amounts. But the wise teacher said, please do not give any chocolate that has got intoxicants in it, because these months they have never taken intoxicants, so they're very sensitive to even a slight bit, you know. So you might find monks become woozy or drunken, mm. right? very bad karma. You know? <laughs> so there you are. The monks, the good monks are very careful with even the slightest fault. They do not want to get into trouble. Because it's going to be difficult for them to meditate after that. They start thinking, oh, I kept all the rules, but I broke this one. You start thinking about that. And it plays in your mind, you get distracted. Right? For, for lay people, of course, the, you, you will tell yourself, I better don't do this, because if I do this, then I'll get into serious troubles. I'm sure to get into trouble, right? In Singapore, we know that very well, right? We should never commit a, even a small crime. You get caught, you know? So we don't want to do that. Okay, so that's morally virtuous, yeah? Then the next one, he trains himself in the training rules he has undertaken. There you are. He, I mean, this monk and nun himself has declared that he's, he's a monk and a nun, and there are training rules, so you should follow them. So this is the fourth reason and condition that will bring you wisdom in the training of the holy life. Next, section six. He is deeply learned, remembers what he has learned, a store of learning, whatever teaching, Teachings that are beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end, and doubt both in the spirit and in the letter that proclaims the holy life utterly complete and pure. In such a dharma, he is deeply learned, remembers it, masters it verbally, investigates it mentally, will well penetrates it by seeing or by right view. So this is the study aspect. Not just study anything, not even a PhD, you know, but to study the suttas. You know, imagine if you call the Buddha a venerable doctor Buddha. What does that sound? Number one is a contradiction in terms where the Buddha doesn't need that kind of title. It will show that his Awakening is not enough. It's not good enough, you see. So imagine if a monk uses a title, doctor or something, it shows that he doesn't value his monkhood, or he needs this title to boost himself up. So it's a contradiction in terms. So this is where, you know, if you know a monk is really good and virtuous, like Achan Chah, for example, we don't need to say, Doctor Achancha, or anything like that. Just the word Isha Achancha say, oh, this is a wonderful teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you should be good for the Dharma itself. We don't need other props. Okay? So, this confidence is very important. This is faith in the Dharma. So, you got to be deeply learned if you want to be like this. And, and what do you learn? You learn the Dharma, the, the proper teaching with the Buddha. Beautiful in the beginning, moral virtue. Beautiful in the middle. Mental training, beautiful in the end, training in wisdom. And it, the, the teaching is complete and to teach you the holy life, meaning pure. So he remembers all this very carefully. 
So this is called being deeply learned Bahusacha. And then this uh, one leads to two, the basis for the rest. Yeah? So you, now this is number five, now quality number six, industry. Section seven, he dwells exerting effort in abandoning unwholesome states and promoting wholesome states. Strong in effort, steady in, his, in the task or not laying down the yoke of wholesome states. Right? So this is right effort. Right effort means if something bad is not done before, it keeps it that way. Number two, if he notices any bad habits that has arisen, he immediately stops it. So these are the two negative efforts. And then the two positive efforts, number three is he starts doing something good. Let's say he's not meditated before, he starts meditating. And the fourth right effort is go on doing it. So to keep on doing it, keep on doing it, then the, the monk is safe. Otherwise, you will feel bored, or, or as they say, uh, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. Yeah? So you get all kinds of ideas and, and discontent if you are lazy or you play idle. So as a thing, effort is very important. Diligence is in fact the, a primary quality in Buddhist training. Diligence is putting your mind and body to, to the task. In this case, practicing studying, understanding the Dharma. And then next, it goes on to number eight. When he goes before the Sangha, he does not engage in rambling talk or low talk, no small talk. Yeah? Either he himself speaks the Dharma or he requests someone else to do so, or he breaks not the noble silence. So this is what monks do when they gather together, good monks, they speak the Dharma, they discuss the Dharma. Of course, they do talk about other monks also. If you're long enough in the retreat center, this is how you hear. They either talk about other monks or they talk about Dharma. Otherwise, they observe the noble silence. So the noble silence here, simple meaning is not to talk, observe silence. But the special meaning is get into jhana especially the second jhana, third jhana, okay? So this is the eighth and last, uh, the, sorry, this is the seventh quality rather. And now the eighth, the last quality, section nine. He dwells observing or contemplating rising and falling in the aggregates of clinging. Thus, this is form. This is the arising of form, this is the passing away of form. And the same thing for feeling, perception, formation, consciousness. Now the five gates are what our whole being is. Form is the body. So if you reflect, okay, this is my body, this body is made up of four elements, it is impermanent. And then how does he watch rise and fall? For example, you watch the breath. The breath comes in, rise breath goes out, falls. You can notice rising and falling on your chest, thoracic breathing. You can notice it on your belly, abdominal breathing, rising, falling, rising, falling. You can uh, also notice in feeling, number two, feelings like feelings come and go, the impermanence. First you notice the feeling, you, you observe it, acknowledge it, and then you notice rising, notice falling, impermanence. And then the three, perception, how we recall things, how we recognize things. The information, this is how we think before we act, intention. It's a bit more difficult, of course, on this level. And then consciousness is even more tricky. Consciousness is this very rudimentary awareness of things, of our senses, our six senses, even, how we become aware. That's a bit more difficult. But we reflect on all this as being impermanent. So this is, in other words, the perception of impermanence. And if you do this regularly and properly, you will definitely at least end up with stream winning in this life, the first stage of the path, first stage to awakening, right? So this is the eighth reason and condition that 
uh, renunciation should practice and in a sense we too should practice. So the ending here is with meditation in other words. So the purpose of Buddhist training is you prepare yourself for this moment of watching rising and falling. Right? And then the last part is all these eight conditions are repeated except in this case the, the Buddha says look at section 10 and his fellow brahmacharis, that means the other monks and nuns, honor him thus, so that they respect this kind of person. This venerable one dwells in dependence on the teacher. So in other words, he, oh, this, see, this person, this monk, you know, he follows the teacher's teaching, right? So they respect him. The, so, the next line, towards whom about towards whom he has a keen sense of moral shame, moral fear, love and respect. This venerable one is surely one who truly knows and truly sees. There you are. Can you see that? 10.2. And then this quality brings about love, respect, esteem, harmony and unity too. So this gives a good feeling to the whole community. Right? You know, we're doing a lot of all the sutta work here. And uh, a lot of good monks know this, monks who, especially monks who are studying. So occasionally I, I get emails, you know, like especially from Burmese monks in Sri Lanka. Uh, they say, I'm going to write something about the uh, Sangyojanas, the fetters, you know. Do you have you got materials on this? I say, oh, of course, we've got lots of it. So send it to them. And they're so happy. They say, thank you, my layman. You know, they, they, they like the address in the traditional way. And then the singles are also are very helpful sometimes. And, and I think they're more of a, speaking their own. They, they think in singles so they talk in English. So they call me dear. So I was wondering, how was the singles word for that? <laughs> so, so this is where you find, it's very interesting, you learn a lot of things about them. The monks actually communicating with you directly. Do they feel this need to communicate? Because they don't normally talk to anyone unless they feel a confidence, you know, and this is because they want the Dharma. So you feel a sense of, wow, say, yeah, well, I'm, I'm doing something that helps them, you know. And you know in the future they, they know all these teachings and they become good monks and you feel good about them. So this is the feeling here. The, the, the community looks at this man and says, wow, he keeps to all these eight trainings and so wonderful monks so they respect him and there is this wonderful feeling in that community also. And then, uh, the sutta ends there, eh? saying that the last part, section 18, these big shoes are the eight reasons and conditions that conduce to the gaining of wisdom yet unattained, wisdom that is fundamental to the holy life. And when that wisdom is gained to making it more, making it abundant and develop to fulfillment, right? So, this is how a person should train himself in the holy life. Or we can also adjust this teaching for our lay training. So in summary one more time, is to either find a good teacher, study with a teacher, or you find the Dharma. The Dharma is your teacher and study the suttas by yourself. There is so much material, so much commentary nowadays, you can study on your own and go on studying it and then all this study is to prepare you for mindfulness and meditation, that inner peace. Studying the suttas are like gathering the right kind of ingredients, shopping for the right kind of utensils and tools, learning the method of cooking. And then when you put all together and then you start cooking it, it is like the practice of meditation. right? And then when you're finished eating, you sit back and say, oh, that's nice, but that's wisdom. All right? You have digested the food. Okay? So, this is the Buddha's message to us today. Any questions? Very nice timing. Eh? This just 12.01. Yeah, thank you. Can you repeat the Pali equivalent of the same The Pali words? Yeah, it's all there in your book. You look at the page. Can you see the brackets one? The, the, look at the headers. 
tutelage. Can you see tutelage? Okay, Paliwat Nisaya. Okay, and then number two, inquiry, Paripucha, Paripanha. Okay. Uh, remember, Pari means all around, right? Pari. And then number three, bracket three, spiritual aloneness, Upakasa. Okay, the more familiar word is Viveka. Let me write for you. Brackets 4 is easy, moral virtue is sila, and then brackets 5, deep learning, bahu satcha. Bahu means a lot, very much. Satcha, uh, sutta, sorry, bahu sutta. Bahu sutta, bahu satcha, same word. Bahu sutta means heard a lot, literally means heard a lot. And then number 6, aradha viriya, that means put in effort. I think there's a line over the A, you know, R of the, just check this when we go back, you know, section 6, yeah, R of the. And then 7, speaking Dharma, Dharma Bhasita, Dharma Bhasita, speaking Dharma. Uh, 8, watching rise and fall, Udaya, oh, there's a B missing, uh, Udaya and then dash B, comma, okay. 1B is missing. Udayap Bayanupasi. Okay, let me explain this word a bit. Okay, Udaya means arising. Vaya means falling, kind of disappearing, okay? dissipating. So when you combine these two, okay, first, this, this is the way they write in Pali. You have what's called a liberalization of the V. Liberal, that means the lip sound, right? it becomes a B, easier to pronounce. It becomes a V, it becomes a V, They're very close together. V, you see, V, my mouth is open, then V, my lips are closed. So, this is how you join it up. This is Sandi, you know? uh, lots of this. Like in German, Bali, you have this compounds. Alright, so what I do is, I make it easy for you to read. So I break it up, I put a, com a hyphen here, because the B doesn't really belong to it, but you've got to pronounce it together. Udayak, and then I put a comma, it means this is one word. And then by okay, so this is a missing B in your book, huh? Udaya Paya, okay? In, in, in Burma, they often use the B rather than the V, okay? I think in India also, they, they, they do that. So those are the, the eight Pali words, right? Uh, so yeah, anu, anupasi. Anupasi is the person, the one who sees. The noun is anupasana. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or feedback? You talk about kema, P-E-M-A. Yes. But what is the difference between kema and metta? Metta. Kema is a worldly love, like husband and wife. Your love for your cat. Love for the teacher. Love for the teacher, that means you think of the teacher, you bring food, take care of him. That's kind of, it's, it's a worldly thing, but not carnal. Not carnal. Okay? Carnal means sexuality. Yeah? Uh, then it becomes karma. Okay? I, I wrote an article on the title is simply love. There's a whole essay on this. So you can read there the different levels of emotions. Yeah? I hope I can remember all of them. So we have karma, karma is the lowest, 
Kama in Greek would be eros. So we should get erotic. This is uh, sensual. And then we have uh, pena. And then we have metta. Okay, these three are basic. Okay, metta is agape, spiritual love. Forget this one. I think it's called story purity. These are three cases. There's one more. Okay? So this is clearly not right? You can look up the essay section on the love, right? written detail. So loving kindness is a kind of uh, you're treating others as you would treat yourself. Uh, it's a kind of uh, what's called unconditional acceptance, unconditional love, right? Respect means you, it, it's very close to respect. Respect means you accept the person as he is. For example, you meet a blind person, you know the person is blind, so you, you want to guide him along so he doesn't fall, things like that. And you see a, a child, a child comes running in here making noise, and we don't get angry because we know that's a child, so it's the way he behaves. So the Buddha's compassion is in a sense uh, his respect for us because he knows we as worldlings we tend to be playful, we, we don't really listen well so he goes on teaching, teaching us because he, he respects that's the way we are and he tries to raise up from that level to a higher level the, the mother is very special because the mother shows the greatest respect to the child right? so to show respect is to accept the person as he really is not Acknowledgement, not merely acknowledgement of status, and it is something else. If you scale down this aid training, you can you can use it for the lay people. Like I said, tutelage, for example, refers to your spending time, uh, you know, studying the suttas carefully. Yeah? And uh, if you want to be a dharma teacher, you spend some years proper training. Pro in other words, proper training, basically. So no more questions, huh? All right, so we end here. We'll do a short reflection to close. Today we have reflected on the eight aspects of the conditions for the arising of wisdom, which apply especially to the monks and the nuns for their quality training, and from which we can learn a lot of things for our own benefit too. So to be a really effective Buddhist, we definitely have to study the Dharma for the sake of practicing it, which leads to realizing it. That means seeing this truth for ourselves, a direct experience. So what the Buddha is trying to tell us is we have to experience life. And suffering is our teacher telling us the world is not perfect, we are not perfect, and yet there is something there to learn. And when we understand this nature of suffering and imperfection and unsatisfactoriness, then we grow wiser. Then happiness comes to us. <clears throat> Reflecting in this way is very good karma. It keeps us truly happy. By the power of such karma, let us send out our loving kindness for our benefit. First of all, may we be well and happy so that we can study and practice the Buddha's teaching and, and be kind and helpful to others. <clears throat> and also to our loved ones, people who care for us, our family, and those who support us. May they be well and happy. And by the same token, by the power of the three jewels, let us send out our loving kindness to our friends and relatives and Others who are practicing the Dharma themselves, who are seeking the truth, may they find happiness in the life itself. And finally, by the power of the three jewels, may those who are lost and having difficulties find the true teaching in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.